Hello, everyone. I hope you're all having a fantastic week. I'm Steve Zoberg, one of the founders at Forthright. For this series, we're uh, got a big focus on cyber-related topics. We air twice a month, and our objective is to stay laser-focused on one topic per episode. Our last episode, we discussed user authentication, and he's provided an overview on this topic, which leads us to today's episode, where we're going to cover application management. Now, we at Forthright, we believe cyber hygiene and cybersecurity starts with each of you. And of course, a solid framework that guides all of us on the processes that we build and enhance our cybersecurity readiness and maturity posture. So executing on this framework is really the only way to improve your odds at remaining safe and secure. And at the end of the day, our goal here today is to share with you what we've learned and what we do at Forthright to successfully protect our clients and our ecosystem so that way you could do the same in yours. We wanna share our knowledge with you. We wanna share our wealth of experience. We wanna share real world examples with as many people as possible through this series. And we wanna empower you so that way you can fight back and tilt the odds in your favor. So we've decided to use this forum in a way to drive thought leadership in our community and also do some quick fire style type of events like we're doing here where you join us twice a month. It's 20 to 30 minutes and you get to go back to your day. But each time you do, you're learning something new. And at the very least, at least you're checking in on how your current strategy is going and how it compares to what others are doing in the industry. Of course, we welcome and encourage questions and comments. So feel free at any time to speak up and uh, you can let us know in the chat during the sessions. Or of course, you can send us an email to success at forthright.com. We'd love to hear from you. So today's episode, uh, user authentication. What is it? Why does it matter? Where does it fit in the whole picture, right? To answer these questions and more, I am going to introduce our host for these conversations, Forthright's Chief Information Security Officer, Heath Geeson. Thanks, Heath. Thank you, Steve. Um, you know, each one of these in this series, I've kind of started off talking about the CIA triad. And if you haven't seen the first one, where we talk about identity access management as a whole, I recommend you go watch that. I recommend you watch all of them in the series, but that this particular series here is uh, is about that. And reason I keep bringing this up is because it's so important um, for us to understand this concept. The CIA really lays out the basic pillars of an information security system. Confidentiality is about ensuring information is only available to the people that should have access to it. Integrity is about maintaining the overall accuracy, completeness of the data. And one example of this is maybe file revision history. Um, availability is making sure the right data is available to the right people at the right times, right? Um, it doesn't do any good to have confidential data that's not available to anybody. It's not any good to have confidential data if you can't guarantee the integrity of that data. Is it accurate? And it doesn't do any good if ever, all of the data everywhere is always available to everyone. Um, the reason I keep bringing this up is because the whole point of an identity and access management program, which is what we're really talking about each step of the way in each episode, we're laying the groundwork for that, how to build out that management program, uh, identity and access management program, is the whole purpose of that is to serve these three principles, right? The CIA, the triad, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Without properly identifying, authenticating, and granting access to a user or system, or that could be a software package, there's basically no chance we have achieving these principles. So we have to be utilized identity and access management to achieve the core of these principles. <clears throat> so in our overall identity and access management uh, conversation that we've been having, what we've been talking about is how to implement that using a conditional access process. Um, in this series, we're discussing this and how we can control it. In the last episode, I talked about user and location signals. In this episode, we're gonna tackle application management. This is another signal used to feed that conditional access system. This one's one of the most overlooked. This one and the next one, we're gonna talk about device compliance in the next one. Those two are the huge ones that are really overlooked a lot. Um, and and it, Today, we're going to talk about why that's important to your overall security infrastructure, the benefits of it, and how to implement it. This is a lot to cover in a few minutes. If you'd like to discuss further, please be sure to reach out to us at success at forthright.com. I'm always eager to discuss these topics. And so I guess right now, hold on, because here we go. We're going to go into it. What is application management? 
Well, application management is a systematic approach to monitoring, maintaining, and controlling an organization's applications throughout the entire application lifecycle, right? Lifecycle, meaning we have a beginning and an end. Applications come and they go. In the middle, hopefully, they do a lot of useful things for us. Um, first step of doing this is discovering your applications, building a catalog of applications. If you haven't already done this, you, you probably already have a tool in your system somewhere to do at least partially some of this for you. If you're a managed services client of, of Forthright, we definitely have tools that we can go do this for you with. Um, if you have Microsoft M365, most likely you have the licensing to help you produce a lot of this information for you already. Um, next step is developing your security policies. Security policies are the way we determine we're going to deal with risk, right? One of those things is gonna come up in your policies, it should, on what you have to do for any software or application that needs to come into your environment or is in your environment already is a vendor review and acceptance. Let's look at the people who publish this application. Does it hold your data? Is your data stored in their environment? What are they doing to protect it? How is that being backed up? Um, what kind of reputation do they have? It's very important that you look at those things. And then enforcing those access, enforcing those policies by implementing access control and permissions to applications, putting a lifecycle management policy in place and program in place. And then we monitor the usage and analytics and go, how are these applications being used? Who's using them? How are they using them? What are they using? What are they accessing with them? Again, all stuff you might already have some information about in your organization uh, and just may not be aware of it. So if you want to look at that, be sure to give us a call. Happy to go through that with you and see what you, where you're at as far as moving towards this direction. So why does all of this matter? What, is this, what does it mean to me? Why should I even be thinking about this? Um, well, let's talk about the why behind this. Why, why would you do this? What are the benefits? Um, application management is an integral part of the identity and access management strategy. Fair to recognize this, will unnecessary expose your organization to risks. Right, 89% of organizations have experienced identity-related security breaches in 2023. That's right, 89%. That's not eight or 9%, it's 89%. So I, I, that's probably the only stat we need, but we'll keep going. 98% <laughs> of cloud services are shadow IT. What is shadow IT? Well, shadow IT is any software or hardware or IT resource used on an enterprise network without organization's approval, knowledge, or oversight. I once had a relatively heated discussion about this with a colleague of mine. Uh, he was under the impression that once you know about an item, about a package, software package system that we didn't know about before, it's no longer shadow IT. We now know about it, it's not shadow IT. Uh, I disagreed then and I would disagree now still. It has to be approved by the organization then the organization has to properly manage it and provide oversight for it. This requires budget dollars. This is why I say things like shadow IT kills organizations from a financial point of view. And people don't always understand that, but it's true. 78% of un, uh, have unauthorized app, 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 applications. 70%, 78 of the organizations out there have unauthorized applications. I guarantee you have unauthorized applications in your organization. I guarantee there's somebody running something that has an unauthorized application. If you haven't authorized any of your applications, then all of them are unauthorized, right? So we might even just look at it and say all of them are unauthorized. 65% face data exposure. Face exposing data out to outside systems. I once had a client that I started working with, this was several years ago, and we discovered that uh, she had a laptop, company laptop. She took it home, worked from home, and she uh, let her son use it to do his homework. We discovered that all of the work documents she had put together were stored on her son's personal school OneDrive account, not a company account, and she worked in accounting. So you can only imagine what kind of data was exposed out there to people who should not be having access to it. So. What is the business impact of this, right? Well, once you start using cloud app security or application management, we're gonna use, though not really synonymous, but for our purposes in this discussion today, we're gonna to call those two things synonymous. Achieved 
an average 127% return on investment over three years. So whatever it cost them to implement this, they got that back plus in less than three years. A 60% reduction in time spent on security management tasks. I can't tell you, you know, we have to secure everything that your company uses. If your company uses a lot of applications, it's going to cost a lot more. If your company uses a lot of applications that you don't even know about or random, it's going to cost even more, right? So financially, reducing that footprint down, making sure it's approved, you understand the risks with it, it's going to save you a ton of time and money. 92% reduction in time required to identify and remediate security risks. I think I've said enough on that. I don't, I'm not going to beat that horse anymore, but uh, this is definitely something on uh, you should do. <laughs> Obviously, something that could save you money and makes your business run better and be more secure. I, I don't know how much more benefit there could be to that, right? So let's talk about some of the security benefits. Improve threat detection and response. What does this really mean? Once we have a better handle and understanding of what we should be monitoring for, we can better understand what anomalies look like. And when we understand what anomalies look like, we can have a better understanding of what to be alerted on and where to look for things. This reduces your cost because there's not as much effort that goes into doing that, right? Um, also, we start to gather behavioral information around this. So if an employee suddenly accesses an application from like a new country at 3 a.m., we can immediately know this is not normal behavior. But if we haven't cataloged this and started to build that behavior out, and there's just so many applications anybody can be using at any time from anywhere, then it gets harder to determine what is allowed, should be allowed, and shouldn't be allowed. Um, enhanced visibility into application usage. It goes along right along with what I was just saying. Tracks how applications are being used, shows what users or applications are accessing what data and when. You know, an example of this is maybe we can see now that one of the departments is using. 15 different file sharing apps. Now we can, if we identify that and we deal with that based on our application management policies, we're able to come back and go, wait a minute, why are we paying for all of this? And if we're not paying for it, where is our data and where is it going? Because you know the old adage, if you're not paying for something, you're the product. That means they're using your data for something that you don't probably don't want them to. Um, and we could identify those, reduce them down. It happens all the time. Uh, one of the common things we see is multiple file sharing, one, one drive, uh, Dropbox, Box, Google Drive, File Share, some other, you know, Mega. Um, all of these are free, it can, can be free, and people will just sign up for them and start using them, and then all of a sudden your company data is going places you don't know. So that's why it's important to monitor and manage all of this and keep it put under control. Um, Reduce attack surface. We control how much, how many applications are out there for someone to attack you on. You've reduced your attack surface. You've, re you've increased, you, you've lowered your risk, right? Automated security policy enforcement. It's easier to enforce security policies on a smaller set of applications than any application. And real-time threat capabilities. You're able to more respond better, faster, because you know what should be happening and what shouldn't be happening. Your operational benefits. Well, you got a streamlined application deployment process. Um, this doesn't just apply to new hires, but it, it absolutely does apply to new hires, but it, it's a bigger scheme than that. But I always put it in those terms of, you know, when someone comes on board with your company, that's really their first impression. And you want that process to be streamlined and to work as simple as you can. Um, uh, going further than that, you, if you've got to move, you know, retire someone's computer and give them a new one, you want that all to be very streamlined. You don't want a lot of downtime because they're waiting for someone from IT to call them to install an application uh, or go, oh, well, you know, we know that they put OneDrive on the computer, but here on the marketing team, we use Box as our file sharing technique. So go download this and uh, you're going to need to log into it. Just create yourself a login and then we'll, right? All of that just adds chaos, adds different, uh, adds all kinds of problems. You're going to get centralized monitoring and management, easy place to do that. Monitor and keep track of everything because you know where, what it all is. You're going to reduce your IT support burden. The more applications you have, the more it costs to support your organization. The fewer you have, the less it costs. Improved user experience through consistent access. Users aren't going to be confused. 
well, I wanted to send Tom and engineering this document, but here in marketing, we use Box. He doesn't have Box. How do I send him this document, right? Better resource allocation and planning. You can start budgeting better because you know what you're buying. You know where you're going. You can start looking at how you can optimize those licenses. So we talked about security benefits, operational benefits, financial benefits. I keep harping on financial benefits. So uh, I'll just go through these real quickly. I won't bother you with a whole lot of these, but you are going to eliminate redundant applications. You're going to optimize your licensing costs. You're going to reduce incident response costs. If you do have a security incident, there's not as many possible ways someone could have come into your organization. So it's going to reduce the time to, to have that incident response. Better resource utilization. Um, you know, if you're... If, if, you might be able to retire some servers because you've thinned down your duplicate apps. Um, and, and informed procurement decisions, you're gonna have a better idea of what it is you need to buy, what you need to budget for. One thing I do wanna touch on this, on that better resource utilization. You know, in today's day and age right now, in the modern world, everything has been moving to online-based, cloud-based, if you will. Um, and software as a service, right? Your Salesforce is that way, your SAP is that way nowadays. Uh, if you're still hanging on to an old client server-based application, you need to start looking at ways you can get off of that. It's going to cause problems for you in the future. Servers that you would have on your premise are going away. You've still got some lead time on that. But it's not going to be long, maybe four or five years, and you're going to end up in a real hurt. So application management implementation steps. How do we go about implementing this in your environment? Again, this is a quick talk, so uh, there's more to talk about here that I could cover in 10, 15, 20 minutes. But I want to give you an outline here that you can follow, right? Inventory your existing applications. Have a clear application request process. So if someone does need an application, they know how to request it, and then it can follow the right process where it gets reviewed for security, financial, operational reasons. Maybe we already have an application that does this, and the user doesn't know about it. They just need access to it. Um, define standardized deployment and retirement process. Not only how do we deploy the application, how do we retire it? And this isn't a detailed stuff. This is your steps, your overall guidelines on this is how apps should be deployed. This is how they should be retired. Um, Implementing your monitoring tools so you can monitor for applications in, in, in your organization and see when a new one pops up. And then really look at your licensing optimization because that's somewhere most companies can really save money. Most companies are overpaying for their licenses in one way or another. And there's usually a lot of money on that table to get some budget to start doing some of these things. <sighs> Measuring for success. So how, how do you measure for success? Well, how long does it take you to deploy your applications now? How long does it take you to set up a new user now? Just take note of that and let's see how we can reduce that. How much does that reduce over the next few months um, as you start implementing this process? How many support tickets does your organization generate? We usually express this in terms of tickets per user, right? Um, so number of users divided by the number of tickets. So you create yourself a nice little KPI there with those metrics. And then you can start looking at that and monitoring that. User, user satisfaction scores. In the beginning, maybe not. Most users don't like change. Nobody likes change. So in the beginning, they might seem a bit more dissatisfied. But as time goes on and people get used to having standards put in place, people start to like that. Um, and you should be looking towards increased productivity because there's less confusion, right? People understand how the system should be used, what application to use where and when. What are some of the common challenges you're going to have to this? Well, resistance to standardization of processes. People are creatures of habit. People don't like change, right? There's a book out there, which I really like the title better than most of the book, um, but I love to talk about it. It's called Change is Good, You Go First, right? Um, that's how most of us feel about change. So how do you overcome that? Clear training, clear communications of benefits, talking about it, letting them know why you're doing this, how this is gonna benefit them in the future, this is all stuff that you need to make sure is, is communicated effectively, answer, let people ask questions and answer them. Um, another challenge is to come again, complex legacy systems. I, I just touched on this a minute ago. If you, <laughs> say it again, if you have some of these very, you know, legacy systems in your environment, I'm sure they have served you very well up till now, 
but this is something you really need to start looking at now. Not doing that is negligence at this point in time. It, the, the, as a technologist, as a security person, it's really the time to start building your plans on that. Uh, and how do you do that? Well, you have to, it's gonna be a phased approach. It's not, usually not something you're gonna snap your fingers and do in one step. It's gonna be a phased approach over time. So that's why it's really important to start looking at it now. Another challenge, the initial setup time. How long does this take? How long am I gonna go down this? Well, it's fine. Let's do the same thing, phased approach. Let's start with our critical applications, then expand, right? Let's do that, take that application inventory, break it up and look at what, do we, what can we control easily, what can we not? What can we start doing, putting things through the process with? So let's recap here. We've talked about why application management matters. We just talked about the risks of not doing it. We've talked about the security, operational, and beneficial and financial benefits of doing it. We've given you a little outline on how to go about doing it. We even talked about how to overcome some common, common challenges with it. Now we're back to our conditional access process where we can see that application management, let me highlight that for you here, where application management right here is one of the most important, one of the four big signals that we get for our conditional access. If we are ignoring application management, it is really, 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 really hard to make, to let the conditional access engine make informed decisions about what kind of access the person should get. Most people are, like I talked about earlier, most people are just doing it off of this one, user location. We need, we wanna make sure we're including all of these. So the next time we get together, we're gonna to talk about devices and device compliance and how that signal plays into the conditional access process and what you could do to implement that and get that going in your organization. All right. So this is showing us the whole picture of this series here, right? So we've talked about user authentication. We've talked about uh, application management. Next time we're gonna talk about device management, then we'll get into user risk monitoring. We'll talk about how that again overall starts to build out our identity and access system, how that plays into our data governance and protection, which then allows us to securely use Copilot. This is all boxed in, as you can see here, by our conditional access process that's going to work with us to make sure we're doing all the right things to keep everything secure. That's what I have for you today. Thanks for listening, and I'm going to hand things back over here to Steve. I want to thank everyone. Thanks, Heath. I want to thank everyone for joining today. And of course, Heath, thank you for presenting such a great discussion around application management. This was another excellent session and one that really resonates with me for a couple of reasons. Obviously, there's a lot of moving parts to implementing these controls and executing on this strategy. But we, we know that people, all of us, we are responsible for most breaches. This is a very common area that unfortunately is ignored or skipped all the time. And yet it's linked to how most breaches actually occur. Shadow IT presents significant risks. It can't be ignored if you're serious about mitigating your risk. And, and of course, if you're not addressing this today, you're not leveraging application management uh, in, in somehow, how do you know what's actually creating risk in your uh, environment today? What's actually running on your network and your endpoints? You know, Heath, you discussed controlling applications and devices, which of course start by conducting a discovery and cataloging the applications. That's kind of a first step. You know, this requires leveraging a process and probably some tools to gather this information. And of course, uh, at that point, you start building an application portfolio for your organization. So you understand what applications are running, why are they running? Where are they? And so on. In the meantime, while you're planning this approach, and you you definitely should, um, how do you know what's actually happening right now? And do do you guys understand that uh, one of the options you have with Forthread, if you want to reach out, we can do a complimentary CTAP uh, in as little as two weeks. Now, this is tactical. It's a tactical effort. It's not designed to catalog your applications. It's not going to under, uh, it's, but it, what it what does do is it uncovers the potential risky or even dangerous applications that are currently running in your environment, even if they don't show up under installed applications. So this can help identify many of the applications that users are intentionally or unintentionally installing, 
which are unauthorized, uh, not in the organization's best, uh, you know, interest. And of course, in many cases, they pose significant risk and the user is not even aware of it. And in no way, of course, is this meant to replace application management as a function, but it is a quick way to gain situational awareness and uncover the risk that exists right now in your environment, allowing you to take immediate action based on our findings. So just wanted to talk about that real quick. It can, the report can also help you garner, uh, garner executive support for application management by of course showcasing the actual risks in your environment today that maybe many people were not even aware of. If you wanna learn more about this, your website's on the bottom. If you go to success.forthright.com forward slash cyber dash threat dash assessment, fill out the request form for more information. We'd be happy to talk to you. The other thing um, is while each of us can take action today and of course spread awareness, some of you joined, you might wanna have a, a deeper conversation about something else that we touched on today or any other previous session, uh, share your unique concerns, your, your current situation. If you'd like to have those conversations, we would be happy to have those as well. Don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can send an email to success at forthright.com and we would schedule a uh, private one-on-one -on -one call with you. As a reminder, uh, our upcoming schedule and the topics we plan to discuss, as well as the opportunity to replay uh, this and previous episodes, are all accessible by going to forthright.com forward slash cyber series. And um, lastly, we'd love to get your feedback. We appreciate any suggestions on future topics you wanna hear or you would like us to address as we go through this series. We'll look out for your email and your thoughts uh, because your feedback is very valuable to us. And for those of you who have shared, wanna thank you for that very much. This will wrap up today's episode of our cyber series. And as promised, we got it done in under 30 minutes. Uh, we invite you to uh, have your friends and colleagues join us if you think that they would benefit from these conversations. Uh, we'd love to have them uh, sign up and uh, we'd like to push the message out and help as many people as possible. And with that, I wish you a great rest of your week. Stay vigilant and stay secure. Thanks for joining and we will see you next time at Forthright's Cyber Series webcast. Take care, everyone.